So, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm sorry to not to be able to to physically be present. Um, it's one of the consequences of being over 50 uh, that you sometimes run into with like things like enlarged prostates and stuff like that. Very embarrassing. Anyway, um, so um, yeah, uh, I actually come from a background of art and I consider my work, all my work to, <clears throat> to be part of the my art discord, uh, so to speak. Um, we started up as a collective working in, uh, in, in 1996. Um, we did like a lot of collective exhibitions together and so forth. We uh, grew up in a, an environment at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen. Uh, and we decided to, uh, to work together in a more, uh, goes away. Um, we actually moved in together, uh, lived in a collective, uh, did uh, uh, exhibitions together in our living space. So art became part of our, our everyday life. Uh, and we actually work with the prosaic objects that you use in your everyday life. So we, um, we lived in a business apartment in the center of Copenhagen um, and there was no uh, bathroom. So we had to construct one. Uh, we didn't have any furniture to build our furniture. So uh, everyday objects like that started to become part of our artistic discourse, part of our language and part of uh, our way of working with art as such. Um, and obviously, uh, personally, I've always had an uh, interest in design and architecture as well as fine arts. Uh, and I never really saw the difference uh, in the way that you work with uh, with reality. Uh, so for me, it was a very natural way of, of working. So. The idea was moving in together. The idea was to start to rebuild the city from from within, uh, to start a revolution just by focusing on uh, our everyday needs, our everyday lives in the city, uh, and to um, and to try to use that that as a way of communicating with the rest of the world. So uh, very quickly, uh, there was a focus on these strange characters doing this thing in the corner of Copenhagen. Uh, and we started to do uh, exhibitions internationally and so forth. So you'd find this weird, uh, bizarre situation that our bathroom would be at an exhibit in uh, in Tokyo. So, but this was also a way for us to um, to start uh, raising the economy that you need in order to uh, to develop stuff. So we basically transferred money from the art system into our everyday life and into uh, developing uh, new things. So I'm going to go really quickly through uh, the the uh, the beginning of the work. Uh, I've I'm going to leave leave some some of the stuff out, uh, and I'm going to focus on some of the later projects, uh, such as the XYZ cargo project. Uh, it's a production of uh, of of uh, cargo bikes. Uh, so I'm going to run th quickly through some of the earlier projects. Uh, I understand that I have half an hour and usually I would talk for like one and a half, two hours. So I'm I'm gonna try and make it fast. Um so I'm I'm gonna leave out some of the political and sort of uh and uh, uh, philosophical work behind what we do, but obviously that's very important to me. So I recommend that you look at our webpage uh to to sort of look into some of the text work that we've done. Uh, it's n55.dk. So um, I'm going to go quickly through some of the <clears throat> some of the works that we've done, just to give you a visual impression of what we've done. Um, the first uh, image here is uh, a photo of manuals. So inspired by Buckminster Fuller's Manual for Spaceship Earth, we decided that uh, whenever we did an artwork, whenever we created some kind of situation where we would work with art, we would also uh, uh, publish a mail uh, in order for people to get like a, an understanding of what we did and to copy what we did if they wanted to use uh, 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 some of the ideas that we had sort of developed. Um, 
So this was, of course, long before open source and all the ideas about sharing that we're enjoying today. Uh, but our basic idea was that whenever we used like public and private resources to develop new stuff, we would want to share that on an equal basis with the rest of the world. So one of the tools to do that was, of course, exhibitions. Another way was to uh, write a manual and issue a manual whenever we did some work. Uh, so this is like uh, some of the first manuals we did. Like you can see there's like system for sleeping, applications, all kinds of things. In like 1996 until like maybe 2000 on this image. So uh, this is a little bit about the manual for N55 because we considered N55 as a machine that needed a manual as well. Um, we originally, we were six people, then we were four people for a long period of time. And then I uh, took over, uh, worked with my wife, that was also one of the founders of N55. She died, and then I've been working with uh, various people since then. Uh, I'm working uh, very closely together with a former student, Till Wolfer, uh, from when I was a professor at the HFPK in in, uh, in Hamburg, and he was one of my students. And we're now working like for 12 years, I think we've been working very closely together on different projects. I'm also working with my current wife, uh, Anne Rome, uh, who uh, was educated as an architect. Um, she's got a, her own practice, but she's also a very close uh, uh, sort of collaborator to N55. Um, some of the first projects we did. This was one of the examples of trying to rebuild the city from within. Um, it's a... Uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a bathtub. Uh, it's also a biodegradable toilet. Um, and uh, there's light and uh, uh, and a pump inside in order to provide the water and so forth. Um, this was a simple way of creating a bathroom when you didn't have one. This is a collective version uh, with music. Um, we had these openings and social uh, situations in our space we would invite other artists to come and work with us some would you know brew beer or whatever and we'll have to, all these different things together but everything we did like took a starting point in our own need for a, a practical stuff in our everyday existence this is a, a called home hydroponic system it's a, a very early hydroponic system from the early 90s uh, that we did together with a, a Danish engineer who actually helped develop some of the first hydroponic systems for NASA. Uh, and we did this together with him. Um, this is all this is again from the apartment where we live together. So we were able to produce some of our food ourselves. This is Icobear on their way. We needed chairs, so we developed this chair. Um, it's got a ball in the top, so it actually uh, sort of adjusts itself to the spine. Um, so it's a prolongation of your spine. It's very, uh, it's very comfortable and very good for you if you have like a bad back or something. You can see how it works here. Uh, at that point, we decided to um, to try to build our own framework. Obviously, also at that time in Copenhagen. Uh, getting a place to live was uh, very, very, very expensive, uh, ex especially if you wanted to work within the center of the city, as we did. Uh, we wanted to create our, the, their own framework, not be in, in, in uh, the and to be turned it into a system. Uh, yeah. Ian, sorry to yeah. interrupt you, but technology doesn't want our narrative. So give us just a second. Um, sorry, because we are looking at Netflix right now. Yeah. <laughs> You're looking at what? Netflix. Netflix. <laughs> Netflix. Uh, yeah, yeah. We had some, okay. uh, yeah, some divine intervention. <laughs> okay. Wow. But now you're back. But now you're back with us. I'm sorry for that. Okay, so can you see this kind of? Okay, can you see the steel frame structure? Yes. Okay, so this is not Netflix. Okay, <laughs> this is like the real world. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, but it, uh, okay, so we developed this uh, building system uh, actually together with my father, who's an architect, um, based on the on the documents of Fuller Fort Rotunda from the from the from the nineteen forties. Um, but we we decided to make all the parts uh, like human scale, so we didn't need a crane in order to build it. Uh, we used a, a system of uh, they called it the Octa Trust, so you can build this really really lightweight. Uh, very strong structure uh, using very little material. We use stainless steel 316, meaning that it will last basically forever. Um, and we managed to build a whole house uh, that we could live in and lived in for five years. That cost the same as uh, Volkswagen at that time in Denmark. So um, then we borrowed this, uh, this piece of land from the Danish architecture school and we built a house there. For, for a period, we could stay there, but then we had to leave. And because land obviously uh, is very expensive uh, in the center of the city, uh, we had to end up building our own land, piece of land. So we constructed this floating platform that we could place the house on. And we, uh, <laughs> we rented like a normal boat space uh, in the very center of Copenhagen. And we didn't tell the owner that it was a house. And at that time, house uh, was uh, So we also rented like an old uh, uh, sort of studio in the uh, from the Marine, the Danish Marine. Uh, and we built it inside. And one day we just took it out of the house, put it in the water and placed it in the rented bow space. And then we started to live there. And we lived there for five years. So in the background, you can see the Danish Marine. We are sort of within the sector that's like strictly strictly prohibited to be in and so forth. Uh, but my sort of experience from doing things in public space uh, is that if you do something that's sort of spectacular, spectacular in some way that people like, they don't really bother about what you're doing. So we got away with this for 10 years, basically living in a place where you're not supposed to live. Um, alongside doing this and living in this way, we would take like parts of the house or of the boat, as you can see in the front of the solar powered boat, things like that. We would show that in exhibitions in order to finance our existence. Uh, we lived in the house, uh, uh, three people together, and we paid like uh, 200 euros a month uh, for renting the boat space so um we were, we had like a lot of economical surplus to to develop new stuff so this was a way of financing the developing of new things basically we also used part of the house uh, to do other structures around the world this is uh, another work called public things it's basically all the all the functions you need in your everyday life without a roof. So there's a bath, there's a toilet, there's a, like a music, there's a dispenser, there's roll out beds. And like you can actually live uh, in public space using this structure, the slide that would be light in the evenings and so forth. And we showed that around the world. This is another version. It's called suspended platform. Uh, and it enables you to live like suspended between three or in a city. So again, I'm going to go through fast as fast as possible. So this is another one called snail shell system. Um, it's based on a ready-made container from the uh, from the industry uh, that we turn into a living space that you can roll around. You can also use it on water. Live in like this. Inside that box, there would be like all the things you need in order to survive. So there's a toilet, there's a kitchen, there's a vacuum cleaner, there's a bath, everything inside that small box. It's easy to park, as you can see. <laughs> and also place it on the water. It's um, It was inspired by, we, we stayed in Greenland for a while and we started uh, indigenous uh, uh, culture and uh, in parts of uh, the Inuit culture, they would have like in the winter, they would build like igloo cities. They would meet up with other tribes and, and they would live together for a while. They would have like on the snow roads. Uh, they would form this community, temporary 
and then they would you know leave again and next year they would meet some somebody else and we thought we would sort of facilitate that kind of living in a in a western world our first attempt to make like a cargo bike was this small truck somebody played with lego as a child as you can see um it's basically basically a modular truck where you could have like a kitchen you could decide to you could live inside sleep on the top uh in the day you could have like a small restaurant uh you could even have a small farm fold out farm another project called micro dwellings uh, uh we tried to use like a well-known technology from the uh, uh from building ships so this is plain steel plates welded together uh, using a shape that uh, is, is space filling. You can see the model on the table. So you can fill up space just to, like you can do with the orthogonal cube. And the, and the structure was uh, uh, designed to be able to uh, function on land and floating and underwater as well. So this is, that's my youngest son, uh, oldest son actually, many years ago. But this is when it was underwater. So you could live underwater in it as well. Philosophical work. No time for that. Uh, we also made like more uh, like projects like, uh, like this. It's called land. And the idea was that uh, people that had access to land, that formerly owned land, could share it. With other people, this was for like Airbnb and all these like uh, companies. So the idea was to share land with other people. So, uh, and it was kind of the judo system that if you owned land, you could uh, use the formal ownership to allow other people to use it. And, and in that way, go against the whole idea, the whole concept of ownership of land. Um, so this is a place in the, the Southern California we would build these cans that showed and marked that this is a, a part of land. Uh, and, and every time people uh, sort of uh, became part of the land project, they would uh, and, and, and supply the piece of land, they would get a can from us and a manual inside uh, explaining the, pro uh, the project to the public. This is in Holland, Chicago, Denmark, very Northern part of Norway. We made a similar project with rooms, uh, so people could share excess rooms or share some of the rooms that they would use on a daily basis with other people. Um, again, like this was long before open source uh, uh, and all these sharing uh, ideas. Um, this is uh, like a barter shop where you can exchange goods. So you can either decide to leave stuff for others to use. You could. Uh, swap things or you could use things in place it's based on uh, as you can see uh, boxes from airplanes that we recycled we created like a restaurant a library a nursing room like a, a, a lecture hall like 500 square meters of different functions that people could use it was in scotland this is a system of demonstrations that uh, meets the 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 uh, shields that the that the police uses. So this is a uh, lexin, like polycarbonate. So you can you can't break it. This is the N fifty five rocket system. Um, it was a project that we did uh, in Sweden, <clears throat> and it was about like uh, genetically modified crops. So I got a friend in uh, England to uh, supply some uh, seeds that's been genetically modified to. Uh, to uh, withstand different uh, uh, kinds of poison um, that the industry uses. Uh, and uh, we put it inside this rocket that could actually go uh, like uh, 50 kilometers in a couple of minutes. Um, it's, a, it's a functional rocket. Uh, and inside there's these small ampoules uh, full of seeds. So it would go up to like five, if you, uh, fired it vertical, it would go up to about five kilometers uh, of height, and then it would explode in the top, and it would come down in a in a parachute, and the seed would be spread over like a vast area. 
Um, this is inside Copenhagen. And this was, uh, you know, after 9-11 and uh, nobody reacted. Uh, I wouldn't have done it in other places, but here, like the only guy that said something was this Palestinian guy that uh, told me that they used the same kind of rockets where he came from. So, but this is obviously also a point where we didn't share the technology as open as we did with other things for obvious reasons, because we didn't want it to be used for the wrong purposes. This is a project called Walking House. Um, and it's basically a house that walks. Uh, it's not only the only functional walking house in the world, it's also the fastest. It walks 250 meters per hour. Um, it's uh, using a system of 18 electrical actuators. Um, I did it together with a, a student that I, I was uh, doing a workshop at MIT in the US and and he offered to do the programming, same chronic. He did the programming of the legs. Um, and it basically walks in all directions, really smooth. Um, it's got a wood stove inside. And it was originally designed for a project in, uh, Cam uh, uh, in Cambridge in uh, England, uh, where I was supposed to work with, uh, with the Rom Romani people. Uh, and they are traditional ways of moving around in, in uh, carriages and so forth. So it's inspired by the Romani traditional uh, carriages. This is the living room upside. Here's the kitchen and you sleep on the top floor. Um, and then later on, when it was showed at the uh, European capital of culture, there was like a garden on top as well. It can walk for two hours on a sunny day. <laughs> This is for like uh, I have kids and stuff. So three of my friends actually lived in it uh, for four months in 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 uh, in Essen in Germany, uh, walking around in a park. This is how it looks when when people live inside. Yeah, and to to be honest, this is one of the funniest projects I ever did. It was fantastic to sit on top of it. It's like when the Legs are stretched out. It's like four and a half meters high. Uh, and to walk it like, you know, you would walk a dog or something. This is like the interface. It's it's very simple. <laughs> it's a small video, I hope. I don't know how it works. Okay. So I have like 15 minutes more or something. I'm going to try and do it fast. So this project is also about introducing a different pace of living. So it's supposed to be slow. This goes for the video as well. So you have to be a little bit patient. The feet are made from wheelbarrow wheels.
Okay, if you're still awake, I'll continue. Yeah, it's built in a in a modular way, so um, you could. Uh, of course, this is inspired by Archigram that did the Walking City uh, collages once, and uh, I'm a very practical guy, so I bas we basically thought that we would make something that actually works. Uh, so. You can take the house and then you can form like walking collectives or walking villages or even walking cities. Uh, the program doesn't really care whether it's six or a thousand legs. Just going to show. Okay, this is another project that I'm still working with. Actually, it's uh, uh, doing very lightweight, ultra light structures called pure plate systems based on the uh, on different uh, geometries, uh, biomagnetic. Geometers, this is the sea urchin. I'm doing this together with my wife and Rome. So we are basically taking uh, uh, the way that nature builds uh, plate structures like this and turn it into structures that can actually be used. This is like just pictures from our basic research. Did a prototype uh, on a small CNC router. The thing is you can build like soap bubbles, like you can use almost no resources, almost no materials and build like a really strong structure. This was one of the interns that uh, offered to test the swing. This is a three millimeter structure and it's completely rigid. Then we did uh, a large uh, educational room and greenhouse in Bristol at a university as an art project, uh, developing the system into this. And this is one of the latest. Uh, we have, like, since 2010, 
uh, we decided to to try to use some of our experience from within the white cube from within exhibitions and the art system and and sort of take it out into society in a useful way um, and one of the strategies has been this uh, uh, this is the greenhouse uh, and we're working together with a, a company a Danish uh, startup company called Nyor, uh, and they basically use our design uh, uh, for greenhouses and they mass produce it and, and sell it uh, as a sustainable, uh, uh, this is recycled acrylics and stuff. Um, and they sell it as a, as a normal product. Um, and this is just an example of, of one of the greenhouses that we've designed for them. Uh, so this was a way to try to uh, to spread out and to uh, uh, to to use the designs that we developed in a more sort of protected uh, system of the art world. This is uh, for a project in Sydney. It's an underwater uh, space plate. We did for a biologist who have been living underwater uh, for a long time. And then uh, in 2011, another strategy of of trying to to sort of use our experience was to develop uh, cargo bikes. Um, Till uh, uh, on the right here um, is my collaborator on this project. Uh, he was my student at that time, uh, and it's later intern. Um, and uh, I offered offered him to be part of this idea to develop cargo bikes uh, in a very simple way. Um, we wanted to take an object that we could handle. Uh, uh, until this, at this point, I'd been building like really large structures, and I wanted something that was could be used to work with public space and to influence like the way that we use public space, but slightly smaller scale. And the cargo bike was a perfect object for this. Uh, at the beginning, on the left, you can see the the girl on this uh, on this uh, small uh, recumbent track. That was the first model we did. And that's a completely open source model. Uh, the drawings and the copying it, uh, like like thousands of different bikes have been built. Um, you see the parts here. Uh, it was inspired by Richtfeld, uh, the Dutch architect uh, who did this chair. Um, and we use that to make these corners that are uh, statically well-defined. So we don't have to make diag diagonals all over the place in order to to make a strong structure and we didn't weld anything every everything's bolted together uh, and this was the first sort of small recumbent uh, bike uh, and then we decided for the first time because up to this point we had we hadn't done any commercial projects at all we've been trying to stay out of the of the gallery system uh, because it's disgusting uh, and uh, and trying to raise money for our, our work in a different way. Uh, and we had never even thought about sort of creating a product or something. But then we decided to explore uh, how we could create a fair business, uh, how we could create a sustainable, fair products. Uh, and we decided to develop, this is the two SATA version of the, of the open source part. Um, this is from Hong Kong. And this is uh, somebody who made one. <laughs> you know, a strange thing happens when people start sort of further developing your stuff. This is my youngest child and my older child on a trip. Then we decided the XYZ cargo, uh, the, we developed the XYZ cargo trike. It's a, in that sense, traditional cargo bike with a box in the front. And uh, we also like, Finally, it would have this steering that's very primitive, but we made like a steering that's similar to the steering on a car. So it, it, it steers quite efficiently. Everything is made using this uh, Rittfeld uh, principle of corners that are statically well-defined. So we could, that was one of the ambitions. We could have the chain and the mechanical stuff inside the frame. And we started to, to sell it as a product locally produced products um, like in Denmark Denmark is a bicycle country and uh, like 
99% of all the cargo bikes in Denmark have been produced in like uh, low income com countries like Vietnam or China. Uh, they've been transported on container ships, uh, semis that have assembled all the way from Asia to Denmark. It's been produced in a system that I do not support, like the way the Chinese system works. Um, it's been uh, like the tax money that comes out of the production would go to to China instead of to local environments like Denmark or Germany or Europe or wherever it's produced. Uh, so there's a lot of good reasons for not having everything produced in China. Uh, we also have the knowledge uh, to produce the bikes uh, instead of being dependent on like other cultures, other people, other places to have the knowledge that we need in our everyday life. So this is a way of supporting local production that results in local tax payment that enables people to go to a hospital and our children to go to schools. Uh, it means less profit for the producers, but it also means a more sustainable production. It means a more sustainable society. It means a, a better future. So there's a lot of good reasons for this. Uh, for doing this, the 15 largest container ships in the world, 15, they produce as many harmful particles for shipping things from, from Asia to the US and Asia to Europe and back, like empty, they go back empty. They produce as many harmful uh, particles as all the world's cars together. So maybe we should consider for 10,000 reasons not to have everything produced in Asia. It's a really bad idea on many levels. It's also important for us that we maintain sort of the knowledge and that we share the knowledge, uh, how to build stuff that we need in our everyday life. That goes for housing as well as, as like everyday objects like bicycles. So this is an, is an example of a sustainable fair production. So you can take all the parts here and you can recycle it. It's aluminum, it's made from Norse Kultur, meaning that it's produced in a sustainable way using hydropower. Um, you can, uh, you can. I mean, I've, I've built like tables from old bicycles when they were not being used anymore. Um, so you can use the parts to produce new stuff. You could also recycle the aluminum. Aluminum is the second most uh, uh, common mineral on Earth. We're never going to run out of it. You need a lot of energy to produce it. When it's produced, it's very uh, uh, cheap to, and you don't need a lot of energy to to recycle it. You can remelt it and use it again. So aluminum is a really good material. This is not perfect. So we're using Shimano parts. Uh, and they actually, it's Japanese, but it's still produced in mainland China. The motors that we use are produced in mainland China. It's not perfect in the sense we're still using parts from other countries, which is also fine. But the, the, the major part of this production is made locally in Denmark and Germany. And since uh, the last couple of years, we started to uh, introduce sub producers. So uh, we have... Uh, license agreements with people in different places in uh, in the UK, in Spain, other places where people sign a contract. We supply with supply them with uh, all the knowledge they need in order to uh, to start up a production of the bicycles. We help with them with parts and so forth, and they pay pay like a a, a fair license fees back to us that enable us to maintain the development development of the bike and so forth. So the more, like at the moment, uh, we still ship uh, bikes from uh, one part of Europe to another part of Europe, or even sometimes further away. Uh, in the future, we hope to have local producers all over the place again, so that if somebody wants to buy a cargo bike from us in in uh, in Spain, it's produced there. It's it uh, people are employed there, and they pay local taxes that enables the schools and the public health system to develop and so forth, instead of, you know, everything going to a very different place. 
So uh, it's, a, it's a modular system. So one of the advantages of this system is that we can easily make new models. We can easily uh, build special bikes like this uh, street food bike. Um, one of the things that we have agreed with our sub producers is that they only pay the license for the basic design of the bike. They don't pay license fees for whatever thing they put on top. So um, there's a lot of money for them in in making it, turning it into like a, a food bike or something like that. I'm just quickly going to show you different versions of the bike. This is the the two wheeler. Steers, it's got four pivot points, very special steering in the front. It's different. This is a bike that can produce bicycles. So this trike can produce bicycles. It's from an exhibition, design exhibition in, in Hong Kong. You're laughing, but it's actually quite nice that you have like a thing that could produce itself, basically. So. Yeah, again, there's uh, thousands of different designs and different variations over this. This is one of the more crazy ones. It's uh, park, the Park Cycle Swarm. Uh, it allows you to, to create a park wherever you want to. It's the trike again, the, the most simple, basic. A taxi is based on the XYZ cargo truck. So one of the things we learned was version complete open source uh, bike. We sort of met the wall of reality when it comes to what happens to an open design. Um, one of the thing is that you actually still are responsible what come for what comes out of it. Another thing is that uh, people create like really stupid things and really bad bikes uh, that give you a really bad reputation. So we decided that uh, uh, people are of course allowed to make a personal copy of uh, our commercial models, uh, but they're not allowed to uh, to uh, to uh, produce it and sell it. Um, so we have some kind of control uh, over the design. It's protected from uh, a CC license that allows people to copy it for personal use, for not but not for any kind of commercial use. This is actually equipped with their air filter uh, that would uh, clean, as far as I remember, like five cube, cubic meters of, eight, no, eight cubic meters of, of air when you go through the city. Uh, so while using a bike and not a car, you would also clean the air while biking. It actually makes sense if, like, for yourself, if you have a kid in the front. If not, you're just doing society a favor. Favor. This was for the last uh, architectural biennial in in Venice. It's a mobile library, fold out mobile library. This is on its way to Venice. This is a, uh, it's an, an exhibition in Finland right now. It's an office bike that allows you to create your own uh, office and uh, stay on all the nice places in the city without paying rent. And work with your computer. There's of course electricity and so forth. You know, when I did this, it was, fun because I thought this is a crazy idea and who's going to use it. But then I actually used it and I found out it was fantastic because I, I could find all my favorite parts in the city and I could sit there with the best view and work. And it it, it actually worked. I was surprised that this is like, it's not just a fantasy or a good idea. It's actually working and it's actually very, very pleasant to work because you've got your own space and you can still be among people. This was just an, an example of what happens when you do open designs because we did this, the two uh, the, the two wheeler, and uh, suddenly somebody uh, uh, showed us this photo with uh, this guy that you probably know in the corner, uh, and we had nothing to do with it. 
it was just these guys from MIT who thought it was interesting and they built the bike and they were at this uh, fair for open source stuff. So this is a very latest project that we finished uh, one and a half years uh, ago. Uh, my wife, Anna and me, it's uh, in Denmark, we have these uh, 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 system of shelters that are publicly used. So either you book them up front, you pay a symbolic amount of money or you can use it for free. It's placed in all kinds of nature resorts uh, all over Denmark. And it's extremely popular. Families would go out there and they would stay overnight, uh, make a bonfire and you know enjoy the company of other people doing the same. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the Danish Art Foundation made this competition uh, and invited three different teams. Uh, and we won the competition to build like art shelters. Usually this is like wood set out to rot, uh, a, a simple roof and so forth. And we made like a slightly more advanced thing with uh, with local wool inside to prevent condensation with recycled acrylics with large wood that lasts forever. And then an aluminum uh, shell. This is the view from, there's a bonfire place in the center. Um, so this is like a small village that we constructed of uh, five of these that would accommodate at least 30 people placed in a very beautiful nature resort and people can use it without booking it actually they can just go there and sleep there um uh, and i'm just going to show you a small video and that's it for now i think That's it. I don't have any sound. Eo, can you hear us? Oh, I can hear you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. It's, I, I usually speak for a longer time, so I, I left out a shitload of things. Uh, I hope it still made sense or there was some kind of continu continuity within this. So. Ian, thank you very much. Of course, it makes absolute sense. And it's totally com compatible with what many of the people here are doing. Uh, right. um, many of the people are running collective spaces or art spaces. And we would have loved to have you here. But maybe next time we have the opportunity to have you with us. And tell that us. Would be a Great. That would thank be a you so much for sharing. And thank you for your soon, huh? <laughs> cool. Okay. Have a nice conference and uh, thank you for your for your patience. Thank you. Take care. See you soon. Bye. -bye. Take, Take care. care. Bye.